Good evening, everyone. Welcome back to the UCSF Mini Medical School series, Family Health Practices for Wellbeing During the Pandemic. I'm David Becker, and I'm the chair for this course. For those of you joining for the first time, welcome. Um, I am a clinical professor at the UCSF Osher Center for Integrative Medicine, and I'm the medical director of Integrative Medicine for the Department of Pediatrics Center for Pain, Palliative, and Integrative Medicine. As a quick review about this course, the impetus for this was sharing with the community the many ways that practitioners, both here at UCSF and in the community, have approached the challenges of fostering resilience for kids and teens and their families in the community, particularly in light of the challenges of the past year. Tonight, we have the real pleasure of hearing from Dave Berger. Dave is a somatic psychotherapist here in the Bay Area who has a unique breadth and depth in clinical training, practice, and teaching. He received his bachelor's degree in somatopsychology from the University of Maryland and graduate degrees from Stanford University in physical therapy and the California Institute of Integral Studies in psychology with a specialty in somatic psychology. He's been a professor in physical therapy and psychology and has been adjunct faculty at several colleges. Dave's on faculty with the Somatic Experiencing Trauma Institute and the Ergos Institute. He's been mentored by Dr. S uh, Peter Levine, the founder of Somatic Experiencing, and is part of the initial legacy faculty of the SE Masterclasses. With 40 years of clinical practice, Dave provides a unique blend of clinical care for people healing from traumatic injuries, accidents, anxiety, back and neck pain, post-traumatic stress disorder, headaches, panic attacks, and chronic pain. He uses a diverse array of traditional and complementary healing practices, integrating his understanding of the relationship between an individual's emotional challenges, the family system dynamics, and cultural issues. Drawing on the relationships among physiology, body usage, psychology, and emotions, they've worked along an integrative continuum in his clinical psychotherapy work. Dave, welcome. Thank you. Nice to be here. Dave, your, your breadth of experience could give us so many in, entryways into, you know, a lot of topics about the, the, the current environment, how people uh, understand, deal with, manage, approach, stress, tension, and anxiety in their lives. So um, uh, that makes it easy. How about we just start with the idea of, of stress itself? Um, we all have ideas of what that means, that it evokes a certain sense of what the definition of that is or what our experience is. What, what's your, um, your view on that? Yeah, it's, I think it's more complex than we often think about it. Um, and I'm, I'll, I'll start with, uh, I'll start with something about stress that we usually do not think about at all. When I first meet people, I ask them, what's going well and what, have, what are you having fun with? And the reason I do that is because, you know, when people come to see us, um, it's all about what's not working well. But the things that are working well actually can invoke a stress response also, but it's called eustress, E-U-S-T-R-E-S-S happy oriented, excitement, something fun, where our body, our physiology is doing a similar thing as what we typically think of as stress, but it's associated with different emotions that we put in the happy category, the positive category. So that's one kind of stress that I think is actually really important that we remember, that we can actually feel good and our bodies can be doing the same thing that when we uh, as when we don't necessarily feel good. So that's one kind of stress. A second kind of stress is more of what we typically think of, which is distress, distress, where also our heart rate goes up, our breathing rate goes up, or we may get a little jittery, um, our muscul musculature can tighten up, et cetera. And this is the physiology that basically, from the way I look at it, is a call for help. I need attention, something's going on that is letting my, in my body, that's letting my brain know, hey, you know, I need to phone a friend, I need to call somebody, I need to do something uh, that can help me calm down. 
can help me calm down. We can go into different ways of achieving that, um, you know, in a little while. So that's sort of what we think of as an acute stress response, something that right now, whether something's happening now, or I start thinking about something from the past, so my body's reacting as though it's now, is saying, hey, I need some attention, and I need some attention to help me calm down so that I can function more efficiently right now. And then there's a third kind of stress, <clears throat> excuse me, and this is what we can look at as straws in the camel back, camel's back, uh, accumulated stress or an accumulated stress response where when we've had a stressed out time or anxiety time and we don't really completely resolve it, resolve the body's experience of it, the physiology of it and the emotions that are associated with that. When that doesn't get to completely resolve, resolve efficiently, meaning completely physiologically, um, efficiently in terms of the amount of time uh, and, and in, in healthful ways, then it accumulates. So it's sort of like adding layers, adding layers, adding layers. And, you know, we can do okay with that for a period of time until we don't. And that's the proverbial, uh, a, an extra straw on the camel's back, and we do reach a breaking point um, when things accumulate. And that term, accumulated stress response, that actually is Peter Levine's term, uh, and was really the focus of his doctoral dissertation uh, at UC Berkeley in the late early 70s or so, um, and looking at how that uh, at the nervous system from and from that perspective, the accumulation of it. So I'd say those three categories um, that have similarities and differences over time. I really like how you highlighted the, um, the importance for us to understand the positive value and positive association of the physiology of a stress response and that it's valuable and that we actually need it. In many circumstances, um, um, but that for for many of us, the, the the that that kind of quiet accumulation is what we're not very good at, at hearing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know. So so before we came on, um, I, you know, I'm sitting here, I'm waiting, I'm exhaling. Most important part of breathing, exhaling. It settles my body a little bit. But I'm also feeling my heart rate go up and my breathing is getting a little bit more as it's getting more towards six, 601. So if they're going to ask me to turn the, when are they going to ask me to turn the camera on? And oh, all of a sudden it's a, turn your camera on. And what that's doing is helping me focus. It's helping me focus so that I am paying more attention, which means I'm not paying attention as much to other things around me. So it is a very useful response. Stress, a stress response is very important until it's not. Until it, so it's adaptive to the moment until it becomes maladaptive. And then it, it can kind of loop and loop. And if I couldn't settle, oh, turn the camera on now. Okay, click. You know, oh, hi, made a little joke. I laughed a little bit, settles my body down. And now here I am. But if I don't, then if I have another interview in an hour from now, or I have to go to another client, or I have another class to go to, and I'm not going very far because all my, all my classes are right here on Zoom for the, all the children who are in, in school um, and adults who are in school too, right? So I sit and I sit and I don't do anything to decompress, shake it out, move it out between uh, stress responses. Then it starts to build and build and build, yeah. So when you um, come across individuals who haven't been as aware of this for a while and kind of fall into a pattern of, it may present as saying, like many of us actually do during times of stress is that we feel like we're supposed to take on more. And no, I'm, I'm not stressed, actually, I'm fine. You know, I'm just I'm managing everything I've got to deal with. Um, how do you approach helping an individual learn to pay attention yeah, because that is the key. That is the key to everything, if I can pay attention. So I'm fine, but they're also coming in for help. <laughs> and so, well, maybe not as fine as you will be or could be. And 
Um, I think by I'm fine, what they're actually saying is, I'm so used to this that I don't feel it anymore. And so it calls louder. And then I don't feel that anymore. And so it calls louder until there are symptoms, we might call those symptoms anxiety or heart palpitations or muscle tension or chronic pain, et cetera. Those would be some outcomes of, it's, I'm fine, this is the norm for me. Okay, so one key ingredient of helping people feel it um, is to feel their bodies, to feel their bodies and to, to give contrasting sets of sensory information, physical information, because if we feel the same thing all the time, we numb out to it. And that's why it's calling even more loudly. The body's saying, hey, brain, brain, I'm still here. I'm still responding. Will you pay attention to me? Yeah, you know, Dave, I don't yeah. know what you're talking about. I've never had that experience. Right. <laughs> I'm sure you've never had experience. How many patients do you see in a day? Oh, all right. 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 So, well, we, perhaps we could use me as an example. Yeah. And we could do this along the way. So I, I've had a series of um, many crises, issues to address throughout the day to day. Um, I've had a bit of an advantage of doing some of this work in various ways over time. So I'm a little tuned to it, but I also know I wasn't always. And I can feel, and I know that it shows up in how I am around others. Um, and I didn't always used to be aware of that. And I still lose track of it at times. And so if I'm here and you and I are talking and I'm coming to work with you and I'm going, no, no it's just been a really busy day. I mean, and so, you know, I've had a lot of stuff to do with and, and, um, but I'm, I'm here for your help, Dave. So, um, how do I get better at paying attention to that in my body? Yeah. You know, I'm noticing as you're talking, the pace of your voice is getting faster. Did you notice that? Yeah, maybe, I guess. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Try something. Just sort of scan from the top of your head down, maybe into your chest or your belly, down into your legs even. And on a scale of zero to 10, zero, nothing, 10, the worst it's ever been. What's your muscle tension like right now? Um, for, for me, literally, for me at the moment, it's probably a three or four. So I'm not completely relaxed. Right. So try And something. I can feel it a little bit in my shoulders. I can feel it in my chest a bit. And exactly. you know, just a little bit general kind of a little business. Right. And I notice you starting to tighten up a little bit more here as your voice, your, your, your speech uh, quickened. So try something. The, the three or four that you feel, make it a five. Like actually make it a five. Uh -huh. That's probably more like a seven, but that's yeah. okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I got to make it good for effect. That's right. That's right. It's good effect. So make it a six and a half. Yeah. Make it a little bit more than you're feeling it. Right, uh -huh. just a little bit there. And now release the exaggeration. Right. And then again, exaggerate it just a little bit, but just like that. And now release that. And then release that. And it takes a few moments, right? It doesn't, we, we settle more slowly than we ante up. Right, but notice what 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 your body's doing now. Mm -hmm. Well, there's a softening. The shoulders soften a bit. Right. Um, you can even hear my voice drop just a little bit. And yeah, exactly. Your belly is more relaxed. It seems as well. Yeah, yeah. And you can see my belly too. No, it's not that I can see it. I'm just really good at sensing things. <laughs> 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 over the years, you know, you know what to pick up on. Yeah. Right. And, and so you can imagine if, if healthcare providers did that right before they entered the door, you know, if you're working inpatient, right before they enter the door, psychotherapists right before the next client or teachers right before the next class or students, right, right before class starts, let me just check in. Oh, yeah, it's tight here. Okay, tighten a little bit, just a little bit more. And now release the exaggeration and notice the difference, right? You're you're touching on a theme that's really of interest, um, I think, because it's it's not 
very well understood uh, or talked about, at least in much of the community I work in and come from in medicine. And that's the, the, the felt body experience and being able to tune into it. There's so much more of a trend uh, in a lot of good research in the mindfulness community mm -hmm. in, in, in more mind, we call them mind body, but many of them are guided imagery, clinical hypnosis, mindfulness, they're, they're abstract. Um, and so years ago, I started a practice of just that between patient rooms when I was in primary care. Um, it would be based on a mindfulness practice. I would take a moment with a couple of breaths. And in this case, it was a conscious release of the previous room before going into the next. But there was really no attunement to what's going on in my body. Right. And, and that's a part that I really appreciate about your work and, and, and I'm hoping to, to explore even, even more. Um, so oh, with that in, my, in mind, how do you typically advise people to, to manage stress? Mm. Well, I try to tailor it to the individual that I'm working with. Um, I mean, there's some generalities, you know, like I, what I was just, we were just playing with a little bit, some generalities, but I try to tailor it because everybody has, I mean, there are general physiological similarities, but everybody has an individual perception of what um, what's in their environment. They may be similar with many people, but it's always an individual perception based on what brought them into this moment, you know, their history, their baggage, as we might say, their history um, and how that's affected them, uh, what they're doing from moment to moment to moment. Uh, so if I'm working, for example, with, uh, with an attorney who does immigration law, right? um, this from true client story, right? he's going to approach he's approaching his life in a particular way, which may be very, very different than if I'm working with you, than when, if I'm working with a student in high school. So I try to tailor it to the environments that they're, they're each going into and let, make it much less abstract. So we may do some general things, but then I'll bring it to uh, their environment. So let's say, for example, I, I'm seeing this immigration attorney or I'm seeing the high school student and we do this, this contract relax, which actually really just comes from Jacobson's work in the seventies relaxation response. Um, and you know, the student, the high school student can feel a little change in their breathing, a little change. Then I may say something like, so you have that history exam coming up, huh? Right, and right there, right? Okay, let's not go past that just the mention of history exam, notice what just happened, right? Now, can you feel that? And now can you do something of the tools that we've worked with so far to counter it, to ease it up, to settle it, right? Um, and this happens, so I, so I really try to tailor it to each mm -hmm. person. Um, something that, that I often recommend, because there are multiple ways to reduce a stress response. And this is one of them. This is in the moments of when it's happening. Exercise is really helpful, but here's a key about exercise. It's not exercising just for the sake of exercising if you're trying to work with a stress response. It's to feel your body while you're exercising. Oh, my heart rate's up. Oh, my muscles are working. Oh, this. And then even more importantly, when you rest, to feel the, hell, the, the body's responses, to feel those downshift. Oh, my heart rate is coming down. I feel the heat in my, of my body right now. Oh, my breathing just relaxed. I notice my mind is off of the, the exam that's coming up, right? To really name these things because uh, the awareness of the physiological response teamed up with the cognitions Create, can create a greater change in the brain structures and the neural, because of neuroplasticity and brain growth than just exercising for exercise sake. 
and, and this is really important because over time and over practice, it can become more of um, a natural, uh, um, a natural response rather than a, a, an induced response. That way. I, can, I can hear, uh, I can imagine a family saying, oh, this is great. Can you teach my 12 year old with ADHD how to relax and calm down? Um, can you speak to that neurobiological difference? In absolutely. And, and there are so many contributors to ADD, ADHD, uh, sensory processing, the need for some nervous systems, people with nervous systems to actually move during the day and not sit still all day long. How do you navigate through those? What sensory inputs are helpful and what are too many? And, and you know, so for example, if there's a lot of sensory stim and a kid just can't tolerate that, put earplugs in, they can still hear. Um, if there's too much visual. So again, it needs to be tailored. Mm -hmm. Um, I used to, with, uh, with um, my kids, when there was a lot of energy in their bodies, we'd stop whatever we were doing and say, hey, I don't know why we use this word. Let's get the jillies out. And we'd get up and we'd do jumping jacks or we'd run in place or we'd shake and shake and shake. In other words, we get that, the, the sympathetic, the action part of the nervous system. We get it even going a little bit more. And now let's all rest. In fact, you know, what would a what would a cooked piece of spaghetti look like right now? Can you show me? Okay, now let's do it again. So we'd go back and forth between the two. Um, and it doesn't, it's not a one time thing, right? It takes practice over time. And what happens in the relationship between the kids and the teachers or the kids and the parents is, I want it now, impatience happens. <laughs> Yeah. Impatience. And it's hard to be patient. It's hard. Sure. And some of that is developmentally normal in, in kids. That impatience, the quickness from one topic to the other. One of the things I really appreciate about what you just said is that when you're talking about with your kids, you brought in doing something with some clear direction without actually naming it about, okay, now is the time to do this for this reason. Um, you, you, without putting the... The, the, I'm trying to think of the right word. The, like the blame, any the any of the languaging yeah. we do around mind body relaxation, get in your body, you just make it more of a natural kind of thing to do. Yeah, um, yeah. I, I I was when I was in first grade because I would have been one of those kids if the diagnosis existed back then. I would have been labeled. Hmm. But it didn't, and so I wasn't. Um, my first grade teacher, uh, I don't know how she knew to do this. She let me sit on the floor where I could move around. I wasn't, you know, kind of locked into this little, you know, brown chair with the pink and blue desk. I, I, I could get on the floor and I could move around. So she knew somehow innately she knew to let me move around. And I think this is a, a challenge with a lot of environments, classroom environments, certainly Zoom environments, um, maybe at home, in different environments where a certain expect, expected physical behavior exists and not every kid's nervous system is um, skilled at that particular expectation. So how, how can we accommodate the environment so, you know, I, granted, this is, it's hard to um, offer general guidance when you don't know the individual circumstances. But that said, in this kind of a Zoom environment where, you know, families are stuck with the situation of trying to juggle so many things and help their kids be on a two-dimensional screen, what, what would you add to a structure for a day? Mm. Wonderful. Or say young kids in first, second grade versus fifth grade versus high school. Well, certainly with the younger, the, the general framework framework would be mix up the physical activity or inactivity regularly. That's a general framework. So for younger children, can the teacher on Zoom and or the parent Hey, can we get up? Let's get up and let's just let's just play around a little bit. Let's let's dance. Let's dance. Let's move around. Let's wiggle, right? For um, you, you know, let's get on the floor and crawl around. 
maybe, you know, maybe bring out the inner kindergartner, no matter what the age, from six years old to 50, 56 years old. Bring out the inner kindergartner. Um, and so mix up the activity level. You're, in, you're, you're changing up the heart rate, the respiratory rate, the digestive system, and everything else. And so mix it up for middle schoolers, for high schoolers, same concept, but how you do it might need to be different because of the psychosocial environment. Um, and so it, it might be that the teacher in, in the classroom teaches for 20 minutes and now says, hey, everybody, let's try something. And I do this with clients. I do this with clients. I say, I don't wanna be the only foolish looking person in the room right now. All 30 of us are gonna be foolish together. You know, all the stuff you wanna do at a party, but you're afraid to, because people are gonna look at you. Cameras on, cameras off, in whatever way. Um, and each teacher needs to be a little bit creative because they can read their classroom as best as possible. Um, Just as uh, every parent and, and approach right, this as well. from their own background, their own style, their own way, but there's a certain amount of, um, uh, for all of us to varying degrees, there's a certain amount of work to do for ourselves as the adults to be able to lead it and guide it. Yeah, yeah, are the parents, the aunts, the uncles, the teachers uh, willing to really change it up in their own systems because we're role models. And if our role model is sit here and pay attention, oh, that's really hard. If the role models are saying, hey, it's okay to express yourself, it's okay to do this in, a, in an environment that is supportive of learning, if it's in school, if it's, an if it's in a way that's supportive of family interaction, right, um, within, within the context. So it's gonna be each culture, each family culture, each classroom culture, each um, culture is gonna do it a little bit differently. But, you know, what, one, of, one of the key ingredients in all this is that the brain, which registers all this stuff from the body and tells the body how to, how to respond, the brain loves sensory information. It craves healthy um, varieties of sensory information. And if we're sitting here all the time, whether it's in a three-dimensional classroom or a Zoom classroom, or if we're sitting um, and the family watches TV together all the time for three hours and it's sitting, it, the brain's not getting sensory information in the way that it needs to to thrive. And that actually can reduce our stress response is having a variety of appropriate sensory information, you know, age appropriate, environment appropriate, et cetera. Um, it, to, to go back to kind of our discussion about how to integrate this into some sort of structure for kids at home, yeah. Um, there was a question that just popped up about wh what about like a walking desk? Is that a good idea? Um, if you like your desk to walk away, I guess it's okay. A walking desk, you know, um, again, you, I, I, yeah, those, the, a desk that where you can walk like a little mini treadmill with it, you know, um, it can be a very good idea and doing the same thing for too long is not a good idea. It, we need to mix it up. So yeah, walk for a little bit, sit down for a little bit. Walk for a little bit, sit down for a little bit. Um, I have on my desk, I'll show you the three things that I keep on my desk. I keep a, a little squeezy brain, mm -hmm. right? And I play with that in my lap. I, I just, I'm moving my hands around. I have a little um, thing like this with little nubs and I'm just rolling around my hands once in a while. And under my foot, I have one with little sharper um, points and I'm rolling it around on my feet. So my, my feet are saying, hey, you know, you can move, you can do all these things. Um, so a walking desk is nice, but mix it up. We're not meant to walk for seven hours straight. Um, and also pay attention. Um, get up and I, I would I would actually say yeah but can you walk around your room you know I'll get up in the middle of a session I'll say hey let's walk around a little bit 
You know, can we do that? Can we walk a little bit? Just a little, not much. Um, mix it up, mix it up, yeah. Um, to, to shift just a little bit, you, I, I know you work uh, pretty extensively with chronic pain as well. So I'm going to give you like a, a clinical example so that we could talk a little bit about the relationship between stress and pain. Mm. Um, uh, and, and then you can take this example, you can riff on it however you like, but let's say it's a Oh, let's say it's a 12 year old guy who is on a family trip with the family in the back of the van and is just occupying himself by reading or playing games. And, and as many of us can do when we're younger, we can contort our bodies into these weird shapes and he's just got himself all kind of twisted up and he's sitting there and he, we find this out that he's sitting there for hours and has some back pain. Um, and it just doesn't seem to go away. And a couple of days later, it's, it's still there. And then over the next couple of weeks, it waxes and wanes and they're back home, but it still comes and some activities are starting to diminish and it's starting to interfere with um, the ability to attend to classes at times or do certain activities and, and the, um, to, to get to a component of the history in some of this that's really can be valuable in exploring kind of the circumstances of the time, we come to find out that actually it was a really stressful time and there were a series of arguments between, you know, among family members going on at the same time and a lot of tension. Um, that's not necessarily a chronic issue, um, but in that particular time it was. Right, um, right. If assuming that a family goes through all appropriate medical evaluations, looking for structural issues or problems along the way and none are found, how might you approach this? Well, part of it would be to bring the parents in and uh, see if they're willing to work on what in their relationship is creating tension in the, in the um, family uh, environment and because if they can process through that and downregulate that too will um, you know parents parents tension is a contagion in the family and just so nicely absorbed by children um, so that's one component of it for the child There, I mean, there are a number of ways to really approach it. I, I, uh, I'm thinking in terms of games, in terms of play, in terms of verbal processing, but I'm also thinking in terms of, uh, of touch. And optimally, optimally, if it's a healthy enough family situation, uh, one of the things I might do, you, you know, both as a physical therapist and a psychotherapist, I have the advantage of under, understanding different kinds of touch and the usefulness of it and utilizing it. One of the things I might do actually is teach the parents how to massage the kid, mm -hmm. is to teach them how to just, because that does so much. It's, it's about connection and bonding and attachment and, and oxytocin and, and, dopamine and, and settling and really connection. So it, it might be that, that might be one thing. It basically the, a parent saying, hey, I wanna be with you. And the child is probably craving that. So that, that's one, and, and regardless of whether or not a physical therapist or a chiropractor or a massage therapist has found anything structurally wrong, that doesn't matter to me so much. What matters is this connection to be built. And then if there are structural things that can be addressed in, in, in the same way. So that's one. Are the parents providing an environment where there's some play at home also? And I don't mean, you know, computer play. Uh, I mean, actual, you know, let, let's get outside and roll on the grass or, or, or let's get into a hallway in the apartment building and just, you know, play a game. Um, you know, one of my favorite games as a kid was what was it called um, red light, green light, one, two, three, you know, where kids had to run. In other words, engage, engage with them, uh, engage physically. So that would be another way. 
um, warm baths, warm baths help soothe, warm baths that, that um, if appropriate in an appropriate way, healthfully, um, you know, where if it's a, okay with the kid, the parent is either in there singing or talking or reading a book, reading a book um, or on the outside of the door, engagement to come out of that bracing that the child was probably in. And in the in therapeutic work with the child, um, we really need to explore the bracing and the impact of the family tension on them and why they were in this position. I might have them go, can you show me how you played on the computer or on the iPad or whatever it was in the car? Can you show me? You know, and there they are showing me exactly what they were doing. They're in hiding. They're in this little, you know, hiding posture, playing, playing, playing. Oh, wow. Can you, let's just like earlier, I might, can you go into that, you know, would you like a blanket over you to really give them, give them some safety environment? Right? You know, what happens when we take that off? Then we'd start to explore that. Um, or might have them draw. What was it, what, what does that tension look like on paper? And what would you like to do to that tension on the paper there? I just want to get, I want to rip it up, right? There's that energy coming out. So number of possibilities. Yeah, I really appreciate the, 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 the kind of broad view of a variety of, of ways of touching on different aspects of a system um, for a kid and a family. I'm also wondering about the, the way um, that somatic experiencing in particular thinks about um, uh, how the body stores tension. Mm. And when our external um, stressors, um, and so if to to imagine, if you will, um, a, a situation. Let's make it different. Let's call it um, the same situation with a twelve-year-old um, boy in the back of the car reading in a contorted type of position or something, and they have a very minor. A uh, car crash where there's a you know a minor tap or a, a bend, in, 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 but it's for some reason it is out of the blue and unexpected. They're in a weird position and maybe their back muscles have been a little strained by being out of position for a period of time. Mm -hmm. Is well, is this a scenario that makes sense for the way of thinking about how somebody could store? Um, symptomatology well beyond the time period when the muscles themselves would heal mm -hmm. um, or if there's a better example that you would use to illustrate this idea yeah well no let's use that as an example so child is reading and yes they're they're in this you know twisted tight tense position and they're sort of numbed out to it because that's how they've been and 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 the reasons that they've been like that reading like that and then the car is hit. Now, when that kind of um, disruption to our, we call our boundaries, our space, the space that we're in, the car, our personal space happens and it's so sudden and it's shocking, uh, we have options available to us. We can, you know, we stop what we're doing. That's the first thing we do. We go into a startle or a shock response, we stop. And so in this case, stop reading, stop being still, what's going on, what's going on? So we're, where's that danger, where's that danger? And this all happens instantaneously, pretty much, right? And locate the danger. Now I can run, I can fight, I can say, um, mom, dad, or mom and mom, dad or dad, um, what's going on, right? So I'm trying to connect, because that helps me settle if I can connect fight and flight are more you know, uh, energy oriented, action oriented. And if those don't happen, and this is really important, if those don't happen efficiently or sufficiently within a given amount of time, then I can begin to do another survival option, which is to shut down and until help is available. And so my whole system begins to shut down. I might get tighter, or I might even go more flaccid, I begin to shut down until it's safe enough. And that's not a clock safety. 
that's a physiological and relational safety where I can kind of come out of it and, whoa, that was, that was scary. Then I start to feel the fear, right? It might be an hour later. It might be five years later. Whoa, that was a lot. And then I can settle from that. Now, if anywhere along that, those stages or phases or what we call threat response cycle really are not completed, we really can't settle all the way. I, I couldn't get out of the car, my seatbelt was on, where I was told to stay in the car, right? Uh, yeah, but <laughs> I got all this energy in my body and it says my body to my brain, I've got all this energy, what do you want me to do with it? Next best doctor, I'm going to shut down. Right? I can't finish that up. Then what happens, and it's both a, it's a muscular process, it's a biochemical process, and it's a neurophysiological process. I begin, I, I, I have all this energy stored up in me, right? But I can't finish it out. I can't complete it. And it stays held in. I brace or I shut down or I collapse. Now, and, and with all this energy in me, and that's what happens. And it can stay in me. And then it adds to the tension level that was there before the accident, right? It's almost not exactly, this isn't quite the right way to say it, but it's like I hit a brick wall, but I'm still running. I'm still trying to run, but the brick wall is holding me back, okay? And so in somatic experiencing, what we want to help the, a, a person do is to complete basically two or three things. One is, most importantly, the physiology and the neurophysiology of it, right? All the biochemistry that hasn't figured out how, you know, what's adrenaline, catecholamines, and neuroepinephrine, et cetera, all that to find its way out help finish behaviorally. Yeah, all I wanted to do was get the seatbelt off of me and get out of the car. Oh, you know, why don't you in your mind's eye see yourself do that right now? Feel it, imagine it, run. You bring, when it's safe enough, you bring people to the experience exactly. to some degree. Yeah, exactly, right. Bring them to, now not regress, not like it was three years ago, but to the, to the behavioral and physiology likeness of it. Right. So it's a here and now experiential, but re, but to tap into this the, the same physiology about what may have happened at the time. Exactly, exactly. Right, right. So from then oh. so that you can do what? So that it's like my operating system is now caught up to date and I can begin to thrive and not just survive. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, and, that's what it's about. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Can you speak any more to how you go about that? How you guide somebody in that process? Well, and again, that'll be tailored to the individual. So if I'm working with a 12 year old, I might do exactly that because 12 year olds generally have the, not really the abstract thinking necessary, but the creative thinking necessary. Well, I'll bet you just wanted to get out of that car. Can you show me how you would have done it? So I might have them sit in a chair, show me how, or you know, in this big sand tray here, can you show me like where, can you show me the scene? Can you create it in here and let their own creative minds do it? And then, wow, what's your body feeling right now? Right? Or maybe in drawing, or maybe we get out in the schoolyard and, and we enact it right? in those ways. So really doing, doing, completing in that way. Um, with, a, with an adult, it might be a little bit different and we might not uh, actually enact it, but the image, you know, imagery, imaging it, there's a lot of studies on imaging because, uh, you know, imagining, because the whole neuromuscular system fires in the visualization of it, right? And then the behaviors that we see is the follow through. So we can use uh, imagination as well. This is touching perhaps a bit on how you might compare cognitive and somatic approaches to stress management. Well, starting cognitively, so I want to know narrative. I want to know the story in whatever way someone can tell me, but I'm really paying attention, fancy terms, that's the explicit memory, the story. I'm really paying attention to the procedural, the body's memory of it and the body's responses. Because 
if that can change, then the cognitions can change. The belief I can never get anywhere, I can't get out. Well, that's the thought, right? If the, if the body changes, so, oh, wow, it feels, wow, I feel so good having, you know, pushed, pushed on your hands, Dave, like I was pushing the car door open, right? Now rest, now rest, notice what you feel now. So the body changes and that gives different sensory information up into the brain. Oh, Whew. I do have the ability to get out of here. There's the shift in cognition. Right? And, and developmentally, that's how we learn. We learn from the bottom up. We don't, nobody tells us how to walk, right? We, we learn that from the bottom up. So it's really working in, in a similar way as development, but not isolated from cognition. We're teaming them up. Yeah, it, it's really interesting because you're, you're uh, bringing up for me in my own mind a lot of um, approaches that we take in, in our pain management clinic around product pain. Um, and some of the, from speaking from the medical perspective of, about understanding pain as a primary process, meaning a signaling process that has mm -hmm. gone awry in pain processing in the brain and spinal columns neural network. Right. Um, there's, there, in the medical community, there is an appreciation that function precedes pain improvement, meaning finding the avenues to get the body doing moving is needs to happen before actually chronic pain uh, experiences will start to diminish. Mm -hmm. And that makes me think about how we, I, I think this may be related in terms of how you're talking about how it's the body somatic experience driving the process um, more cognitively. Right. And I might add to that paradigm you're, you're naming just a little bit, which is um, to prime it, but with sensory information pre-pain before function, right? So it, it, kind of a pre-function in a certain way that the preparatory patterns toward whatever the function is going to be um, to interrupt the, the signaling, right? I wonder if you could use an example. Yeah. Well, let, can we use you as an example? Okay. Absolutely. Great. Notice what your body does as you think about raising your arms up toward the computer monitor, right there. Did you notice how you just started a contraction in your upper body? Mm. Just that pre-beginning, right? Mm -hmm. And now release that. Now, that preparatory pattern can go toward its usual, or if it's interrupted, it can go toward a different possibility. So if it's usual is I'm gonna do that or with chronic pain, oh, now I'm gonna to go to pain. Now my body's gonna to go to pain. You know, the bell leads to salivation says Dr. Pavlov, right? If we can interrupt the uh, almost the reflexive response at primary, if we can interrupt that before it begins, and do something to downregulate it or to shift it, then we can interrupt the potential of going toward chronic pain with whatever function, rather than just changing the function, we're, ch we're changing the preparation toward the function. Right, so it, it, does that make sense? Uh, well, I'm trying to imagine how that might work, say for, a teenager who's got now chronic shoulder pain that's been there for nine months and that there's again it's a circumstance where there's not a say any uh, laboratory imaging work or physical exam findings that would suggest a tissue related problem mm -hmm. or but so so there's that pain anytime my hand goes up beyond here it's just unbearable doc I can't do it right Right, so what I might do with that kid is say, before you raise your arm up, before you show me where it starts, just think about raising your arm up. 
And now release that thought. Let the thought go right out your fingertips. And I'm purposely choosing the fingertips because that's you know the 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 in the end direction, right? Feel that. Okay. Now try that again. And as though your shoulder had a mind of its own, just allow it to follow however far it would like to go before you think it might start to hurt. Right, yeah. and just, right. Okay, now pause and now rest your arm again. So it's a very gradual approach of close release, close release. I, I, I'm, perhaps this is something you could share too, a little bit about this idea about uh, pendulating or a pendulum idea of going towards uh, a body stress experience and in a way and why that's helpful. So this idea of um, pendulation, if, if, if whether, it, it's chronic pain and it could be any kind of chronic pain. It could be shoulder pain, it could be fibromyalgia, irritable, irritable bowel syndrome. We have, you know, sort of a, a very limited range of feeling okay. Very limited range of feeling okay in here. And then whoops, we hit that threshold or that limit. What do we do to come back? Maybe put ice on it, rest, uh, pray that it goes away, any number of strategies, okay? Um, and we do, do it that way. Well, what I'm suggesting is that, I'm gonna choose a different color. And what you're asking about is this idea of pendulation, is that as we're doing this, if we can, if someone can identify the precursor to the pain response, before it gets to threshold. So here, before, and we, they pendulate back down before, but with conscious awareness, that's a difference, right? And then pendulate up toward again, just to say, hey, hi, I see you, I know you see me, and now rest. The idea is that this line, that line gets a little further away with practice with those pendulations. So the range of what we call window of tolerance or range of resilience, our capacity for functioning with less pains gradually expands, right? Still same amount of energy in our system. Right. But there's greater, there's a wider um, girth for it to live in. Right, with that. And, and taking this back to the theme we began with, which is like the, 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 the added stressors of the pandemic of, um, of for so many of our communities, the, the, the racial tensions, the racial violence, all of this adds layers and layers of tension and stress. Um, the applying that same idea instead of to pain to stress and, and perhaps helping in this case, maybe parents tune in to the subtle signs of things beginning to build and then coming in with the like this, take a break. Okay, time to run around the room right. and release right. um, is, is, is perhaps what I'm hearing you. I don't want to put words in your mouth, but perhaps what I'm hearing in terms of engaging the body as a release before it starts to be eaten too much. I, I, exactly, exactly. You, you know, the, the, it's, I don't know why it's reminding me of it. But, and, and let me just come back to whether it's, we call it anxiety or we call it pain. It's, it's really along a continuum. So there's a stress response. It may be anxiety, accumulated stress. And eventually it's going to become pain. And eventually it's going to become more significant medical syndromes. Uh, that we, that's what the basis of the ACE studies are, the adverse childhood experiences studies are, that over time, things get worse and become medical syndromes. But there, there was a, a, a um, in Korea, South Korea, a number of years ago, 
at one point there was an increasing uh, there was increase in, in bullying in some of the schools. They did a very interesting thing. They increased recreation time, outdoor time, and bullying went down. They were increasing the amount of physical activity the kids had. And the, the bullying activity, all that energy was, that was being taken out on other kids, it went down. So how do you preempt the anxiety? How do you preempt the relational trauma? How do you preempt the, the pain uh, dynamic? It's with engaging the physiology in something else. Yeah. Yeah, physiology and um, another study of school environments would suggest the, the social structure of play. So there's a there was a fascinating study done, I believe, in Canadian schools um, that looked at the hierarchy of, of social play and the individuals that tended to be more directive, more controlling in their play, compare, comparing an environment of a, essentially a sports field mm -hmm. or an athletic field and a more naturalistic environment of uh, nature. Mm. And it turned out that the kids who tended to be more uh, domineering in their uh, behavior towards other kids flipped. The group that was in the, the more athletic kind of environment there was one group of kids and when they were in the other environment, it turned around and different kids started to be leading or directing the play. Wow, that's fascinating. That's really fascinating. Yeah, yeah. It's just as a clue for us in terms of thinking that we have, we perhaps have more ability to shift an environment, even within our own homes, about what kind of play, what kind of activities, what kinds of things that we could create in semi-structure or just play that might tap into other aspects of our kids that we're not as aware of. And, and in many ways, that sort of speaks to one of the concepts in somatic experiencing and trauma healing work. And we provide the container or the environment. And in, in working with PTSD, for example, the body will know what to do if the environment, contain, environment is appropriate. And it's the same thing with children. They know how to be creative given the environment uh, to do it in. And they know how to self-regulate. They know how to self-soothe given the health, a healthful environment for it. Or is it always so structured that the, you know, the energy in their bodies begins to build? Where is the creative play time? Yeah. So Dave, I wonder if there are other aspects of your work or uh, the somatic experiencing model that I'm not asking about that you think would be helpful for, for families to know about? Mm. You know, gosh, we've covered so much. I, I think that if families um, can provide an environment that fosters creativity and connection, then some of the challenges that we see can decrease. And I know there'll be questions, how do you do that when you're living in poverty? How do you do that when you've got two parents that have to work? How do you do that in a stressful environment, oh, say like the past year has been, when primarily moms have had to stay home from work, be the school teacher, be the childcare provider, be the runner of running the house, et cetera. It's not, none of those are easy solutions, but even if it's, you know, five minutes a day, that's different than how it's been, you know, let's, let's just put everything down and let's sing a song together. Let's get the jillies out. Let's do something a little bit different. Um, it might, it might help. I think your, your recognition earlier that every circumstance is different is um, important to bring up because what I notice is that you and I are sitting in fairly comfortable homes. Right. We are, I don't know your background. You certainly, you and I appear as white 
privileged men in an environment where we certainly aren't as aware as regularly as the kind of issues as many families deal with. Um, in light of that, I think uh, my, my thought was, uh, I try and bring in some caution about how I make suggestions about things without at first really trying to understand where somebody else is coming from, what works and what doesn't work. Um, have you, well, I wonder if you could speak to um, anything along those lines that brings up um, ways that you approach your teaching for mm. other clinicians? Yeah, yeah. Um... And of course, this is doing it from the descriptors of me that you use. They're, they're pretty well right on. And, and there are some others as well. So I see the world through a, um, through a lens of my privilege, the color of my skin, being a man, being the person in the front of the classroom in charge of everything, and also knowing that, you know, I only hold a certain framework um, and people are gonna walk into the classroom with a different color skin, with different shape eyes, different size bodies that they may feel, oh, okay, I feel okay being here. And oh, I will, and I don't, or I don't feel okay being here. Or their bodies might be giving them signals, but we, they numb out to it. So part of my, job and I can't say I'm great at it. I hope I'm good enough at it. I certainly get a lot of feedback about it, which has been really helpful. Um, part of my job is to, I am i can't create a safe environment for everybody, but to bring to the foreground how we all respond to environments based on who we are in, re in relationship to the rest of the environment is there a way that we can become comfortable with the discomfort of sharing that over time? And it has to be over time because it's not gonna happen quickly for lots and lots of reasons, right? Um, and, and you know, when it's brought to my attention, any version of you just put your foot in your mouth, Dave, or some other way of saying it, I, help, me, help me figure out why, why I did that. Tell me, tell me, give me feedback. Um, and I think if, if um, you know, if we all did that a little bit more and a little bit more compassionately and really were willing to receive that feedback, I think we'd all be in a lot better place. Yeah, I, I agree. And it reminds me of this general theme of improving our own awareness of um, not only our own bodies, our own somatic experiences, our, our sensory experience of the world, but also um, uh, attuning to the, the impact of the way we go about trying to help others and being aware, being aware of things. Yeah. Can help us. Um, it, it's hard to own being humble about something if we can't tell that what we're doing isn't resonating. Right, right, right. And, you know, there's this phrase, how's it go? you know, fish can't see the water. Yeah. Right. Well, that's really true. I can only see what I know, what, you know, see that. Um, but am I willing to listen? Am I willing to receive? Am I willing? I, I, will, I can't pretend that I'll ever be able to understand the world through someone else. This, someone who has uh, black skin. I've got this other buffer, right? But can I receive what they're saying in a way that um, it might improve our relational dynamics? Um, we all have bodies. We all experience yeah. the same physiology and, and seeing each other as human beings in, in that approach. Yeah, yeah, yeah. While the rest of the material is important to address, it is still... Um, it, it's complicated and not so easy to just try and sum up and, um, right. and wrap up easily. Right. Um, 
I wonder if you could, you know, your background is really diverse. Uh, are there particular uh, theoretical frameworks either in psychology or physical therapy or you know, what do you draw on? Um, mm. you know, I know you've made reference at times to attachment theory and, and, and others. Can you tell me a little bit more about what informs your work? Yeah, I, I you know, I, th I think there are several pillars that that um, that I, I mean, many that I'm informed by more that I rely on than others at this point. I mean, certainly because my initial professional training at Stanford was in physical therapy, understanding how the body works, how the nervous system works, the physiology is a main one. Um, the the migration over to you know pick a decade, pick a name, alternative therapies, complementary medicine, now integrated medicine. You know, that whole field really opened my, my understanding to human behavior beyond just as a PT, fix the body or teach someone how to walk. But much broader understanding. Um, and then delving back into another grad program in psychology, really understanding behavior, human behavior, and, and then its relationship with physiology and um, uh, th those are sort of the mainstays for me. And then techniques that add to that and inform those like somatic experiencing, um, being in movement, other kinds of, of body works, body oriented psychotherapies, psychodynamics, family systems. You know, when I learned family systems in the grad school, I said, oh, systems, system. Oh, I, oh, like physiological systems. Yes, I get it now. Yeah, each part's got to do something and they relate to each other. So then I started understanding systems more and that heavily informs me. Um, so there are a number of things that I, that I pull from that, that uh, um, inform how I work and how I teach and how, and how I approach working with trauma um, as well. Um, and, and I think that one of, the, one of the things I'm very, very interested in now is historic trauma, field of epigenetics. I mean, that's so new. We don't even know what that's going to mean clinically yet um, as practitioners. Um, and how it is what's happened to a prior generation affect me? How does my, you know, how does it affect the people I'm with now in those ways? So, that's sort of a cutting, a new, a new pillar, let's say, um, that I'm really fascinated by. Yeah. yeah. Um, we have about 10 minutes left in our time. Um, there, there aren't currently other questions coming up at the moment. Um, yes, I'm, I'm kind of curious about back to my other question of, yeah. um, is there anything I'm not asking you about the work that you do that or your kind of understanding about stress in particular and this in the in the circumstances families are in that would be helpful for them to attend practices or even resources you could offer for them. Yeah. Well, I I, I you know it's become a, a catchphrase in the past year. We're in this together. I, I but we've always been in it in it together. And you know, through the this whole year the stressors that we've had, the stressors we've had for a long time, really to know that, you know, high family, this one family, you're not alone. Any one individual is not alone. It, we could feel really alone. And, and that is such a challenge. That, that is so exhausting that, that to, to reach out for those people who, you know, don't reach out so much. Um, it's, you know, it's hard. Phone for, what's that, that, you know, game on TV, um, you know, phone a friend, reach for a lifeline. It's really important. It's vitally important to do that. Kind of push yourself a little bit to, to know that you're not, that, that can help reduce a stress response quite a bit too. Like, oh, you've been feeling that way also. Um, another is don't, don't stay on social media too much. Because it could, one is that you're, you're locked into the, either on a computer or on a phone. You're immobile, you're not moving. Movement's a key ingredient to countering stress response. And then what you're reading over and over and over again in various different ways, shapes or forms, whether it's the news or 
you know, one of the social media, we're reading it. Oh, maybe now there'll be a different outcome, but it's not going to be a different outcome, right? Or, or, or hoping that it'll be different to, to really turn that stuff off for more hours a day than you have it on. Um, you know, I'd say get outside and move um, in those ways. So, because those accumulate, that accumulates in us over time as well. So th those are some offerings that I would, would add. Yeah. Well, I really, really appreciate you taking the time to share your, your wisdom and your experience for, for all of us, Dave. Thank you very, very much. Um, You're very yeah. welcome and my pleasure. I appreciate the opportunity.